Hey, what's up, Brian? Welcome. How's it going, man? This is the Broken English Podcast. Really happy to have you. I've been looking forward to talking to you for a while. My sister and I, we used to listen to the Golf Club mixtapes way, way, way back. Yeah. Like, I don't even know if you had any music out when you were putting out those mixtapes. I started playing drums when I was like eight. And then at like 16, I got rid of it because I wasn't listening to anything that had drums in it anymore. It was all electronic or rap or stuff like that, you know? And I got like a sampler and turntables and stuff. And then I kind of made it a goal to myself that I wanted to have my first record out before the time I turned 21. Like five days before I turned 21, the test pressing came in the mail. So like, that's like, awesome. Worked out like perfect timing. What kind of music was that? So it was like really fast, built through Disco House. Like at the time, the biggest people doing it were like Bad Boy Bill, DJ Dan. I love Bad Boy Bill. DJ Dan as well, of course. James Hype is kind of like the new Bad Boy Bill. <laughs> no comment. I think I think Bad Boy Bill for me is one of the best sets, best DJs I've ever seen, to be honest. And I don't think enough people have seen it. What do you think? Like, I can't think of many really other people that play yeah. house music that do a bunch of tricks and play a bunch of acapellas and all that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. But no, Bill, like, yeah, that was like the first CDs I had. And then I had like tapes from like, uh, Paul Anthony, Mark Almeria, Paul Johnson, Terry Mullen, people like that. That's really uh, cool. At first, I actually didn't know how to use the sampler. So I would take Paul Johnson tapes and just like loop the cool parts of the tracks that I liked. And then like basically reconstruct it by like one by one hitting the things. Like I wasn't even sequencing because I didn't know how to do that yet. Like, So you were in it from the beginning then? Well, I didn't know anybody that did it. And there wasn't YouTube. Well, yeah. there might have been YouTube, but not like no, there wasn't. today's YouTube. Well, you know? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I mean, I don't know if it might have existed back then, but I, if it did, it was like infant stage, you know? I'm not a thousand percent sure, but I think YouTube comes on in 2006. It's not even how it is right now or anything similar, you know? Yeah. Let me see. 2005. I wasn't far off. Okay. Yeah. Like 10 years off. <laughs> So yeah, 2005, we were pretty grown up by then. It's a lot easier now to to figure out stuff, right? Also, I think culturally, at least my experience was people that knew how to make music, they didn't they did not want to tell you how to do it. How about you? I, um I didn't really have that problem, but there was only a few people and I seriously like go to parties and like, like wait until the begin or go to the beginning or after the set and try to talk to like Mozzie and like uh, Stacey Kidd or Paul Johnson or like all these people, Caesar, Angel Alanis, like all the people in Chicago that were doing stuff with NPC. Cause that's what NPC wasn't the first thing I had. I had an SP 808, which sucks. We tried to like use it like years later. And we're like, maybe I was just stupid before. Like, now I have, like, 20 records out. Let me try to do it. And it still sucked. <laughs> like, um... <laughs> so let, let me ask you something. We're talking about this back then. With the career that you've had, I mean, you've done really, really amazing things, both in music and in business. What What's, like, the tip that you would give yourself back then that might save you a bunch of time and maybe move your career on, along faster? That's a good question. I guess looking at everything as a brand, um, like obviously there's art is the key part of your brand, but it's like, if you want to be realistic, like uh, just think about like from the very start, if you don't pick like a good name and you don't like, it's hard to explain, but like the more you plan it, the more it'll help later. Like, for, okay. For example, uh, country club disco, like when we started that label, it works with golf clap and everything, but like kind of later on it became hard to write that on everything. Cause it was so long, you know? And so gotcha. like, there's like lots of little things you just kind of like figure out as you go like that. But I guess they like brand identity because like, for example, you, uh, there's, I guarantee there's people out there that don't know any of your music, but they're like, Oh, I, I don't really know much about him, but I think of him as like a guy that knows his shit about studio stuff because subliminally they've seen you do these podcasts before and like they've seen your name on Dirty Bird and stuff. You're still building a brand, even if they're not like a fan, like yeah. it's kind of like building, like building your reputation up to where when they do finally listen to something, they kind of want to like their it. Ears are yeah. yeah, yeah, I get you. I mean, I realized that, that was a really when... long answer that. Cause I didn't, no, I mean, uh, I get it. But... Think, think of, think of the brand way before. I think that usually people will tell you just 
just make something and just choose whatever it's not it doesn't matter so you don't have to wait for it to be perfect but sometimes it does affect you and uh like for me it my name i've been looking to change it for a long time just because it's so uncomfortable to search yeah <laughs> but it's such a hassle when you already have like a lot of releases out and uh for example beatport doesn't change your name so you basically kill your beatport profile it's a bit of a mess but i am looking to change it soon i just don't know what to do with it because my my second last name is salazar so i've been thinking maybe ernesto salazar that's also very long <laughs> it sounds like a minimal tech dj or something yeah which is not what i am so it's it's complicated i did also find that when i started doing like music tutorials that a lot of people came up to me about that so like ah, i love your your tutorials more than hey your music is dope which happens but i got a lot more people coming up to me for that again so i guess it's kind of like instead of thinking about the what everybody wishes things were like everybody is inherently selfish like like not even like in a negative way right now i'm just saying like we all want like okay i saw a video the other day that was they put it in a good, in a good way they said like every day everybody wakes up and they have like the straight line path that they're planning on doing and when you ask them to like listen to a song you're asking them to divert from that path and so like that's kind of a big ask sometimes like even if it's your friend like okay so if i'm going through twitter and your song comes up I, I might listen to it if I feel like it right then, but it's very likely that I'm going to skip it. And then like later I'll be on Beatport and kind of be reminded because I saw it and be like more likely to hear it then or something. But like, I'm not necessarily going to leave the app that I'm already on the thing I'm doing to, and I'm not listening to music that I'm scrolling. Yeah. You know I mean, maybe I'm listening to music too, but like, I get you. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a complicated thing. I think that everybody has to be somewhat of like a business person and an, and an Instagram model and so much stuff. It's a hard battle, especially for people that are not naturally like that. I'm definitely not naturally like that. Like I really, I like this podcast because it's just me talking to friends about music. So like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's for sure where I'm at, but it's hard to go out all day film your food film everything and think about right. that all the time and i gotta make my music and also do other stuff i wanted to ask you how you have been and also with country club disco on the business side i just wanted to ask you a little bit about that i don't think you've ever talked about it i've just seen it from afar how you build <clears throat> This giant Facebook group, how you set up your SMS messaging, your list, and like you've been two or three years ahead of everybody else and you're not a like a huge company. How did you do that? I would love to know more about that. So I, it kind of started off like almost a bit obsessive for me <laughs> and like doing too much on every platform. <laughs> like I had to like kind of like find a point where it's like too much and then back off, you know? Um, so as far as the group, Originally, there was like maybe 100 people in the label, I realized. And I was like, or that had something to do with the label or done a remix or something, you know? And I made a private group and only invited them. And I remember there was like, once there was about 100 people in there, I made a post and it was like 97 people viewed. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, I've never, yeah. it was like 10, 20 times my engagement of like a normal post. You know what I mean? Maybe not yeah. that, but it was very, very high. Like, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So I made another post and then I started adding more people. And then I was like, this is stupid to just make this a private group. Like this should now be like the country of Disco. So, you know, Layback Luke. Yeah. All right. A long time ago, he had a message board. A bunch of producers were on there that were like 16 that were like Dutch that were on FL Studio. Some of them were like Afrojack and Bart Beemore and like, okay. like pretty much all those people <laughs> yeah. were on that message board like before they blew up. Like that was like the place where you'd go and everybody would talk about production stuff and i'm still talking about it to this day and so like i mean not that much <laughs> like maybe in the, you know once a year or something but like it stuck with me i remember thinking that's really cool that even if you didn't like layback luke that much or, i mean if you hate him you probably wouldn't go on his message board but like if you were just kind of like oh whatever you would still go on his board. Plays for producers to me yeah you'd still go on his board and you would like form like an emotional connection with that name and like that community yeah. you know and like so with my group, I kind of always thought about that. I'm like, if I can get people to just be in there and 
do the things that they do in there, then it's like you ingrain your name into all of that, you know? And that's why I'm like, try to be picky with what I let in. I mean, not super picky, but just, I don't put, I don't let people like post their new song or their new, especially like random people which just yeah. usually, usually tries to do it, you know? Oh yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> but, but at the same time, so someone like you, if you had like a, a specific release or something that was more important than usual, or like you had one that was charting, and you message me or something like it'd be no problem to post it it's just i don't gotcha. make it like a like everybody will just do that then and then nobody will think the group's useful because it's just a bunch of shit that from djs you don't know yeah. they are you know yeah i mean I, I i totally get it i think there should be like levels like tiers you know what i mean and maybe if you are above a certain tier like you know that you've been involved in the group then you can post links and if you're not then you can't that would be interesting something close to what discord is but there is but it's just very informal because it's just mm. me manually doing it like oh, gotcha. like for you example for example you posted a couple times about your roast and by the time yeah. i saw it like it already had happened and so i just gave you access to post it there the only thing i so i try to make sure people aren't fighting and stuff so like i never said the word covid the whole time <laughs> you know what i mean i was just like if i if i make one post about this it like throws a big monkey wrench in the whole community potentially if like these four people are going to kind of hate these other four people. And then for like a year or two later, they're going to disagree with all the things they say about music now, or just cause they're pissed at them or, yeah. I, I think America as well is just so extreme with stuff. And uh, it's not a politics group. It's just a music group. Uh, okay. So I, yes, yeah. but you can't like, in, in theory, yes, but you can't strip those things away because it's like fundamentally, as a human, you're going to be biased. And get, like, okay, Donald Trump could make like the best like Spotify playlist ever, and I would still be like that motherfucker and find some reason to not like it because I don't want to like it. <laughs> or if somebody like they stand for something that you don't believe in general and you know that, yeah. then like that is going to sway what you like a lot. Like. There's so many people in music okay. that like, it's not, not even a secondary, like it's like a very, very low on what matters to a lot of people in the scene. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just what it is. Like, yeah. There's yeah. some people yeah. that are like, oh, I just like uh, big events and stuff and being involved with events. Yeah. I'm, there's a lot of aspects. Of, I've talked about this on the show that I do on Wednesdays uh, that I just moved to kick. I just, I left Twitch. I'm kind of tired of Twitch, but I've talked about that a lot there. And when people ask me, like, how do I make it? Or the people that I work with, that I work on their projects and I help them out. There's just different avenues to what you want. Like, what is the goal? Do you want to make really great music that will be long lasting? Do you want to get on a stage as soon as possible? What do you want? Because it's a, it's a it's very different. If you want to make great music, it's not it's not easy, but it's easy to to know what path to take. And that's just getting better at music. But if you want to be on stage as quickly as possible, I don't think my recommendation right now, 2023, would be like hunker down and, and just concentrate on making beats because for most people, that's not enough. Right. I mean, one, I want to understand people's mentality on things. Like when there's like a artist that I don't like in pop music that's really big, sometimes like I'll listen to it extra because I'm like, what's the appeal here? I need to like understand it. Like even if I don't agree with it, I want to understand it you know yeah that's i mean that's a good method so you make this group you make it grow how did you move that to maybe music sales or people going to your gigs or like what steps did you take after that with the group you said yeah uh, i mean it's just more like my central hub uh it's hard like i don't have like a specific way that i monetize it or anything it's just more like i'm going to be doing a bunch of things that are relevant to them and the more okay like let's say i'm sure this works with you too like if you review someone's track on your show they're more likely to like your post on twitter when you or like listen to it on spotify or something because like they inherently feel in some way they like they owe you you know what i mean like okay like when you when somebody does something for you like you want to reciprocate in some way like just on a human level yeah 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 so, yeah like, of course so mostly you use it for for a connection that's how i use the show as well We're building up it's exactly that all right so i saw another video about this recently but uh 
describe exactly what I do, but he's saying like, you basically, you're building up goodwill. And once you get like a surplus of it, you can take out and be like, do this, like listen to my song or buy my merch or whatever it is. You know what I mean? And then you subtract a little bit each time. I mean, it's just like any relationship. Like if you're with a friend and they like buy dinner for you three times in a row, like you'd want to reciprocate. I'd say that's it all. Like, and you wouldn't want to ask them once you go, like you lower your amount too much because you're like, oh, I can't. Oh, like I don't, I'm out. Yeah, it's like you like you have a, a fuel tank. Let's call it. Yeah. That. And so like you have to. You fill it up and then you can take it out, but you, at some point give, it's gonna be empty. You give away too many sample pack, or you like uh, yeah. review people's tracks, or you help them get on a label, or you just respond to their message like thoughtfully or something. You know what I mean? Like any of those things builds it up a lot and then like once they get to a certain point then they're telling people about it you know yeah have you had any like like a meetup of people from the group from the group at some point informal ones that so like like for your gigs yeah i mean but if there's I don't, like when i was touring more it was like i'd post every gig in there at least and it was a good way to oh and you're asking about the text thing too yeah yeah all right so i haven't been doing it as much lately i've But it's basically, it's the best way to communicate with anybody. You know what I mean? Like, uh, this is a really old study and I don't remember exactly. So like, take this with a grain of salt. But it was something like emails within like a day and a half get 70% of them read. Wait, 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 wait. wait. I, I'm sorry. I messed this whole thing up. It was 30% of them get opened and it's a day and a half later. That was for uh, an email. So uh, Facebook Messenger was like, Like seventy percent of them get opened over a couple hours, and then text. It was like in the high nineties percent get opened within like six minutes or something. So it was just like such a more direct way. But it also there's lots of gray area on how much permission you really have when you have an email or a phone number or something. You know? Um, yeah, you need a relationship as well, right? If I receive a message from you, I'll receive it. I'll open it up. But if I get a text from somebody, I have no idea who they are. It pisses me off. That's for sure. And it, it has happened. And I want to say this for anybody out there that's watching. Make sure that you have a relationship before sending out an email or before sending out a text, especially because if I just get a promo text or a promo email from somebody that I have never heard of before, 10 out of 10, I'm not reading that. That's a fact. So try to create a relationship, try to show up, try to talk to these people and put yourself out there. And then, yeah, then you can send it. But if you just steal a mailing list yeah. and send out emails, especially to, to DJs that could help you out, that's a, that's, yeah, that's a bad one, at least for me. Right, right. Okay, I'll ask you one final question on this like business side. Have you been looking, like you're clearly a data guy, you're doing research. Where do you think that DJs and producers should be? Facebook groups was what, 2018, 19, and, and 2020 was Twitch. Where is it at now? I don't know. I guess for me personally, it would be to let go as much as you can, as much as you can of like traditions and like the ways things were and try to focus on like what's actually happening currently. Like, for example, like people like all hate on Spotify, but it's like, okay, that's where like 85% of music is listened to besides YouTube. So it's not really a streaming site, you know? YouTube's the biggest one, I think. The mentality is in general, like, yeah. like DJs that are like, oh, they're using sync or they're using that mentality, I feel like holds me back. You know what I mean, just like kind of okay. accept what's happening and go with it I said what's happening you know I mean like it's, yeah it's not like it's gonna go backwards so <laughs> yeah it's like you're setting your foot in the sand for something that you're eventually going to change anyway very likely no and we're so far from the same conversation and I think that now people don't even care if uh, artists make make music not even make their own music but like make music like I've seen a uh, in the past year the change pre pre covid and to now there's been a change from oh like i don't like djs that you sync or look at this dude he he was ghost produced to lineups full of artists that 
literally have no music but have a good vibe and a really good online presence if you're like expecting people to not use sync i think you're way off <laughs> i mean depends right it depends where you're at like if you go to europe and if you're playing in berlin or if you're playing in any like spot right there they might throw you on some like cdj 100s and you gotta know what to do with them honestly i don't even use sync but it's not like a statement it's because it it, it's not fun. It, it's not even that. It's just it, it's so natural to me the other way that it feels unnatural doing it that way. Yeah, you know I mean, and like, but like, I don't have a problem with it. Like, and I guess I'm saying things are changing as far as that. And like, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't care, but I do respect the craft. Let's call it that. So, but how? However, if you don't know how to DJ, please use sync because that's going to be terrible. And second, I would rather have a DJ just play off their laptop if their tracks are great and it's a great set than have a DJ that has has a terrible set, at least for me. If I'm, at, if I'm in the crowd, I'd rather have a good set with great music than a very technical set with terrible music. Yeah, I mean, I guess as much as everybody wants it to be all about the music, it just isn't currently. You know I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. The, th the things that you want it to be all about the music aren't. You know, it doesn't mean yeah, you can't be all about fair. the music and you can't do whatever you want to do. But like, thinking that everything else revolves around that is just where you're going wrong, or not you, but you know, like. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. I mean, for me, it's mostly about music production. Like DJing is cool and all, but if I hear something that's really well done, it's a good, good production then that person will get my respect. But no I'm saying what. as far as like a, if you're a club owner or a oh, festival promoter, like it's like the people that are really good at making music generally are sitting home and not in the position to be big because if they were, they would have less time to be doing that music. And yeah. so it's like, it kind of makes sense right, yeah. about the ghost producer thing to some extent. Like, all right. So even with like golf clap, like when we were touring and stuff, it's like we had an agent and a manager and everybody's like pushing you to do like this next thing that like before you're even ready for it all the time. And like, it's like, they're like, Oh, if you could just deliver this thing, we could all make more money. <laughs> you know I mean, so there's all, all this pressure from like, so imagine if like you were like a really big DJ or something, you don't really have time to do a lot of stuff. And you have like an agent and manager being like, it, like, let's say you're just, musically not ready to do what you need to do at that moment there's times with golf clap where i was like really into making like this like funky stuff but we were playing tech house and like i didn't like i would try to make tech house and it just didn't feel right i tried so many times and like i could do it sometimes but like writing more melodic stuff just comes out naturally and but it's like that's not the product that was needed at that time for me, it was I think it was actually the opposite. Uh, nobody asked me, but I was making tracks at some point that I didn't want to play in my sets. Like they didn't really fit too well. Yeah. So I made the conscious decision to be like, all right, I'm, if I'm putting these tracks out, people are coming to this show to hear the tracks that they they hear on Spotify. So I gotta make tracks that I want to play out, and I like to play. You know, I like to play pretty not not hard, not like techno, but I like to go pretty hard. So that's where I'm at for sure. Yeah. Uh, another thing is, all right, so the last eight months or so since like, I started working on this album with the dropout, basically in the background, instead of having like TV or something, I would just have YouTube documentaries and interviews with a whole bunch of like uh, musicians and stuff and was just trying to like learn more and get more inspired or whatever, you know? And one thing was I was looking at a bunch of music business type of stuff and everybody else besides DJs have a totally different way of pushing their music. And like, it's probably more effective <laughs> and good. I'm just trying it out now, so I can't attest to whether it is or not, but just like, can, can you tell us a little bit about it or you yeah, yeah, keep it yeah, it's just like, close right now? All right. So for one, every, like DJs are always thinking about like a long time ago, you get your promo ahead of time to people and stuff like that. And I feel like now it's like maybe a weekend or two tops, but like, it like no one cares when it came out kind of, you know what I mean? It's just like, if it, if you give it to them right when it comes out or something, it's like, it's 
pushing the song that people can shazam and like yeah it's almost like you're you're not helping yourself like you used to be by doing it really early and stuff basically your release starts on day one you might want to do a couple little things to like tell people about it and hype it up but like day one it's out now you now you start promoting and like set up like content for as many days as you can physically make yourself do it the dropout is from here originally in detroit but for years now he's like lived in california and he's flying out here tomorrow and then we're gonna have four straight days to like get a bunch of pictures a bunch of try to actually do my music video or two like we're making appointments with a whole bunch of different people and just kind of seeing what we can get out of it you know because it's like basically TikTok and YouTube and Spotify all kind of talk to each other on the algorithms. And I didn't know how direct it was until I paid attention more and researched it a lot more, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's what I, I'm trying to do in another genre. They'll go and do like a round of podcasts and a round of shows and promote. And it's just a smart way to do it. And comedians do it, but musicians don't do it. They just send out an email with, with their tracks and let's see how it goes. I think, but... I think it's a cultural thing that I kind of had an epiphany these last eight months too. Like uh, I was reading that Rick Rubin book, the creativity one. I haven't read it. Okay, yeah, I you know should. What it is. Uh, basically, all right, you know what limiting beliefs are? All right, so basically I knew what those were, but I never applied it to creativity and music before, like he was saying. And he's like, when you sit down to do whatever your creative project, because he's not really talking about music necessarily, but you know what I mean? He's like, you could read that book and it could be about like painting or something as well. It's just about creativity. He's like, basically when you sit down and open Ableton or something, it's like, you've already made one choice now that is going to kind of dictate a bunch of things, you know? And then if you're like, I'm going to make a house track. So it's like right away, you're going to have a kick pretty much doing the same thing. And it's going to be between one tempo and another your kick is probably going to sound similar to all your other kicks, because even if it's a different one, you're looking for the same sound pretty much every time, you know, closing your box a little bit, you know what I mean? So it's, I mean, it's because I was doing stuff for DJs, but I, I've never thought about doing songs like in a different time signature or like changing key or like all these like things that just aren't in the vocabulary of somebody that's making normal dance tracks you know yeah yeah i got you uh, i mean we are locked and on the will a dj play this and instead of album mentality but it's hard it's hard to have an album you know and uh, well okay so as far as the not promoting thing though like it's because everybody's telling her like saying you have to have a track every month and put it out and schedule it like everybody's taking away from like the how much uh, to be into a song so like if you really wanted a song to blow up like imagine instead of, okay so i'm not saying you should not make all the other songs too you know like make as many songs as you want or whatever but if after a while you can kind of really focus and get the best ones like really done up and get a get an actual vocal on it like maybe even get backup vocals on it depending on the genre and like uh get people on uh fiverr that are session players and stuff like that you know also fiverr if you really go through all their videos and clips first and like really vet the people and only ask for a job from somebody that you're like what i'm asking you to do them to do is so much lower than everything else they're doing and they're like hitting every like perfect note like like basically where you're like confident that they're going to do what you asked for and a little bit more you know like stuff that you didn't even know about because you don't know music as well as they do you know and that's, this isn't all for tech house, you know what I mean? Like for like tech house or something, it would like at least the vocal part. So like not just a vocal, but like if you get like a, okay, if you actually have a vocal that has lyrics and stuff like that, and you have like a singer that's featured, it just is a different category of like what you can do with it now. Think about like if you were trying to do TikTok or something like, and you just have a song that has a splice sample vocal, that's just kind of like not memorable. It's, it's not a bad song, but it's like a cool track. Like, it's more like a, I don't want to use this word, but I'm going to, like, it's more, it's more disposable. You know what I mean? Like, oh, 100%, a lot of yeah. tracks I agree. you get as a DJ, like, you're like, okay, this is cool until I get the newer version of this by some other producer on the same label, you know? Yeah, I agree. And uh, that's definitely where I'm at. I like making tracks that I can feel proud of. And uh, maybe I don't put out a track every week, but the tracks that I put out, I know like if somebody listens to them in their headphones and they'll feel the level of detail and love that I put into them. And that's that's what I want, because in the end, what I have seen in the past couple of years is people no catalog at all put out one track that goes well and 
literally be headlining with artists that have been putting in the work for 20 years. So clearly it's not about the quantity. It's about how well those tracks go. Even though that's not even what I'm looking for, because what I'm looking for is longevity. That still proves the point. One thing I look at is like, I think like if this was a Drake song or a Taylor Swift song or an Elton John song, like it was the biggest song that existed, right? What, think about all like the, like the, the end game stuff that would happen with that. It'd be like, okay, they might, they might make a whole merch line out of it or something, or they might make a cartoon series, like like things that would never happen with your song, but just like think about it in that context or like pull back from that then and say like what theme and content in this song is rich enough that I can extract all these things that potentially could blow this up. If, if you have a theme, lyrics and a meaning and like imagery with it, again, you can use fire or something for this, but like, you get them to make like little animated drawings or something of like two characters and like you associate that with the song now and like now you can make merch for that song now you can make a music video out of that song now you can like use those for a million tiktok videos later and like but if you just make the song and you set the splice sample and you're trying to get it done in like a day or two you're kind of limited you're like okay i have to put one of these out at least once a month because i'm really just rolling the dice that somebody else is going to do the work for me kind of like if I send it to a label that's already established, will they push it enough? And then will their fame rub off on me enough that like, and then sometimes nothing happens. Sometimes a little bit happens. Like every once in a while you kind of get a home run, but it doesn't, doesn't mean you're going to be John Summit over it. Like it just it depends, you know? I have done that and I do that and I'm not going to name the tracks or videos, but I've gotten singers on, I would say release some high level stuff and some really high level videos. And I believe that I would never do that again, unless it was for myself on my label, because if you're putting that kind of effort, you might as well make sure that you put the push behind it. The thing is, from what I see right now, a lot of these labels, even though they're great, they're not thinking, okay, I'm going to grab WavePoint and he's going to be the artist for this label for the next 10 years. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, that's a big commitment, but yeah. Well, it used to be like that. It used to be labels were crews and they would build artists and push them. I don't think that's the point right now. The point right now is let's just sign what's hot this month and maybe next month you're never going to be on that label again. Maybe if you have a couple million Instagram followers, I don't really care if you even have a track, we're still going to put you on. I've been in situations where I put in a lot of effort into getting something of massive quality and it hasn't gotten the push. And I'm not blaming anybody, definitely blaming myself. I guess the investment in that is how do you become Drake, you know, even if it's not at that level instead of, okay, here's this track in this comp. That's the, that's the thing for me. Again, like a lot of it is the intent, like a lot of people make tracks that are designed to be more or less disposable tech house track. You know what I mean? Like it's trends. Yeah. yeah like, but I mean, like there's, if there's no like theme and it doesn't say anything and there's no like doing something that's memorable, then it's just like a beat and a bass line and a couple uh, uh, sounds and like that is replaceable with any other one. Like, and another thing is uh, again about like people thinking about the old days and stuff. It's like, people are like, oh, this person, they just made music and stuff like that. It's like, okay, they did, oh, they, when they did yeah, it 20 years ago, it was way fucking harder. Like literally anybody can do music now, maybe not like at the greatest, highest thing, but they can go sample and they can use Splice and they can get, they can go in fiber and, and like get someone to mix their song once they do it or whatever they want to do, you know? They can buy a fucking song that somebody yeah, just made. Yeah, you can buy a uh, placement on a playlist. I'm saying, that, so it's like, as well. that's not the bar to entry anymore. Yeah. Now it's a brand and people caring about you. Instead okay. of like using yourself to blow up a song, like use the song to blow up you because like you're the commodity or like, you know? A hundred percent. I I agree. Yeah, either either you have a uh, number one every couple months on Beatport or you got to build yourself up as a brand yourself because if not, it's just not going to happen. Well, yeah. That's the, that's a fact. Yeah, so that's what kind of what I meant is like in the DJ world, they're doing, a lot of people are just doing, okay, I don't want to say like, because it's not like it's like a lesser art or anything because they're doing it that way, but they're making it to where I want to get this on a label and once 
they put it out. I'm going to send to a few friends, but it's their job to get it out there and make it do well. You know what I mean? That's like how, like, I'll do a few random things, but once it comes out, it's kind of like already promoted and you just have to see how it goes. And that's kind of like a way a lot of people look at it where I feel like it's opposite now where it's like it comes out. Okay, now the work starts. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess the question right now it, okay, real quick. with what you just said is, yeah, go what ahead. Was it? I'm not leaving the DJ world by any means, but I'm like exploring the out of the DJ world more than I used to. So what were you going to ask? I get that. I was just going to say that if this is what is happening with labels, then why not just push your own shit? That's honestly what I'm hearing from most people that make their own music. If really I'm the person that's going to have to do all of the push, I'm the one that spent the time, the money on the studio to get this struck out, then I might as well get 100% of it. A few things. One, if you want gigs, being attached to a label is way easier. Like, if it's a label that's like, like Dirty Bird or something, if you do music with Dirty Bird, you're way more likely to get bookings and stuff, you know? Second thing is just... If you put a song out, that's like a your blue check mark saying, oh, like, like there's a bunch of people that didn't believe that you were a real artist and now you're on a cool label. Like it, if you put that out yourself, a bunch of people that say it's cool would have just blown it off, not even listened to it, not gave it a chance, not even wanted it to win because they don't care about you yet. They care about Dirty Bird and you were just able to like attach yourself to it just enough that like a little bit of their swag rubs off on you. And then now the next time. Yeah, it's a quality stamp. Yeah. And like for sure in the beginning yeah yeah that's how all these things are it's like uh okay so like your song you not you but yeah <laughs> proverbial you sends it out to somebody it could be a really good song but maybe they don't know who you are they looked at like your instagram and like it looked like very unbusiness like just like a personal thing not many people following and it just like made you have some reason to think oh I, this is probably gonna be whatever you know what i mean but then if claude sends it to you and says like, hey, can you play this? Yeah. Which I'm not saying he does that, but like <laughs> if he did on like the far example of it, yeah. you hear it in a totally different context, you know? And like, Oh yeah, I agree. I think that there's a quality stamp for sure. And if you're coming out of nowhere and you don't have a label after your name, it's a complicated situation for sure to, to get listens. A lot of people, they don't listen to the music. They just, you attach to something that, that they do know. And then they're like, oh, okay. But if you don't give them that, then... I know people that just listen to playlists. Like if it's yeah. on a playlist, they'll hear it because they got that playlist, but they don't actively seek music out, which I get because that's us. We love electronic music, but most people are just living their life. So they want to hear something in their car. So it's it's a different experience. And, but and I, I is, mean, I'm, yeah, I would say like, like club owners, I've seen like from experience, they they're music fans, but they're like usually not specifically like DJs or something. You know what I mean, they're like, you're like, oh, it's cool, whatever, it's making me money, like, I, I, I like it a little bit, you know? So they want something that's, like, within a few degrees of separation from something that has made them money. Plus, if uh, somebody wants to come play and they're like, oh, well, they just did a song on Night Bass and they did something with AC Slater and they're like, oh... We did AC Slater like three months ago and we fucking made a killing on that. So this is like the cheaper AC Slater that's not quite as big. Like that's how their brain is working kind of, you know? Like, Whatever genre that happens to be making them money at their club yeah, likely yeah, yeah, isn't yeah. what their like favorite thing is. Yeah, you know I mean? It's probably just something they're like, oh, this is cool and like I'm, I'm into it. But like same thing with like when you're a big DJ touring, there could be a point where a year or two, you might not really even love what you're doing because you're just kind of going through the motions and like other things are making you happy. But you're like, you now have an ecosystem around you being like, yeah. okay, I have like 10 people working for me more or less. And if I just deliver this product for them three times a year and just show up, take a bunch of pictures with the people I already have, like pay I'm paying for it and do this and this, then this whole machine keeps running and I can just do that shit on my spare time, you know? Yeah. I mean, what I was going to say about the club owners is that I completely understand that it's a business as, as well. At some point, like you got to pay the bartenders and you got to pay rent. So I get that. What they want is to sell tickets. Like I get it. It's it's completely reasonable. Same with labels. Like I completely get that if you're a big label, you got a bunch of employees, like you're saying, in the end, you need to make money. It's not about, all right, let me just put out the purest form of uh, music, no matter what this person has, even if they don't have any presence. 
So, okay, that's another thing is that I always see people like complain that labels don't listen to their promos and they don't respond to them and stuff. And it's like, you're not entitled for them to necessarily, unless they, unless they put something like reach out and we'll get back to you type of thing. Then, you know, maybe you have some reason to be upset about it. But like with, when I was doing country club disco before, at one point I changed like the bios to say not currently accepting demos because I was like, for the last two years, I haven't, there hasn't been like one unsolicited demo that I've got that I really care about. <laughs> And because it's not just about the music, there's a bunch of things that play. So at the time, I was like, there's tons of music everywhere. It's really dope. But to narrow it down, what I want is U.S. people that are like tour ready. Or, you know what I mean? They're, they're like, have played a few gigs out of town. On a, They've got a flight for, you know what I mean? Like potentially six months to a year from now when we're doing shows that we could book them and it would make sense. Like they're like, that's somebody that gets $1,500 every weekend or something. I mean, like it kind of has like that reputation. Yeah. You know? It doesn't mean if there's something amazing that didn't fit that, I would have signed it. But it's like, in general, I'm trying to build that, you know, like, and. Yeah, you're building a brand. You're building a, I, I, it makes absolute sense. I think people forget, you know, yeah. people forget because they're, they have their own job and then they're making music on the side and they're like, oh, I don't, I don't understand why, why this person is not getting back to me. They have a million things going on. I, I, it's not like I saw your message and I decided like, fuck you, I'm not going to answer. No, sometimes it's like, I'm always going to do a bunch of extra shit as a label to push it. Yeah. That like, I always find myself being like disgruntled at some point if I find out that I don't really like them that much because I'm like, fuck, I'm doing all this shit. And like, it's yeah. not even for like, I mean, it's partially to build the label, but like a bunch of the stuff is like, not really building the label, it's just building the artist. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, like I'm, I'm doing so many gimmies and like, they won't even like respond to my email for like a week. Like yeah. I get like offended and I try not to, but like, so to combat that, I would like listen to all the promos and everything that were coming in. And if I saw somebody's name a couple times, on like labels that like i don't want to say names labels but like labels that are like smaller quality labels that aren't that big you know what i mean like if they're like releasing on there and i really like a couple things then i'm like oh not many people know about this and i can tell this is better than all the other stuff that's coming out currently for the most part you know i'll hit them up and try to just chat with them and like see if they seem like they like are aware of the label if they want to do something or you know what i mean like if they're like all about it and they have like, I'll try to get something from them. Like it's more deliberate, I guess. Even if it's really good music, there's so many more things where I'm just like, oh, well, can, can we book you? Do I like talking to you? Are you the type of person that has a social presence that's going to help push it? Or like, are all, are, or am I going to give you all these opportunities and you're going to fucking fumble all of them because you don't even have an account or you don't do it or you know what I mean? Like then if I want to sign something now, it's like, I want to do all these extra cool things with it, but if I don't have the things to work with, then I can't, you know? It's kind of the th same thing with the theme. Like, so again, if I was like a tech house producer right now, I would find somebody that's like the same size and same trajectory that you get along with, do a collab, and then both of you use your combined whatever to get a vocal and make it the best you possibly can. And then possibly do a dub mix if, if you want to get like more of the vocal just to have it, you know what I mean? And then do like your cool guy tech house mix for the other one. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, now you have three different people that like, you can do a bunch of videos and stuff for it. And you can like, I guess, instead of pushing all these songs, hoping for a home run, just kind of like d doing the minimum on each one more or less, you know, and being like, concentrate on one and put in the effort. Yeah. And like w when you have more of a theme and more content to work with, there's so many more options. Like you can do, you can get more people to care about it. You can make more stories about it to tell people, you know what I mean? That like get them interested. Yeah. When a pop artist puts out a song, they're like have a two month content run where they explain how they wrote it, how they put it together. And, and if you're going to put out a song and it's like, well, I grabbed this play sample and this kick loop. Right. That's what I'm saying. A lot of it. And I'm not saying not to put those songs out either, but I'm just saying that if you're doing songs like that, they have a limited amount of things that you can like talk about with it then, you know? It depends a lot on what your goals are. If your goal is to hit it, I think you're a thousand percent right. If your goal is to make tracks that you really enjoy, you can do that as well. But you need to understand that if you're making tracks that are pretty left field and clearly are not going to go viral or do well in the mainstream, then don't complain when they don't. I think that's something that you got to keep in mind. For my label, I tell people that want to sign to the label immediately, 
like, hey, this is not a put out a track a month label. I'm not competing. It's not a, a label in that sense. This is a label for people that make Acid House, Ghetto House, and Electro most likely don't have any other place to put it. And I'll choose tracks that I think are fire and that's it. I don't care about anything else. It's all good. But I do tell them because I don't want them to be surprised by what I'm doing. And what I'm doing is putting out tracks that I think are dope. And yeah, I am pushing them. I don't consider it a label like the one you had or Dirty Bird or that kind of label. There's no way that I can sign the tracks that I want to sign and try to do that. It's basically, there's no way for me to do that. I thought about it a lot and that's why I hadn't started a label. And then I said, well, I want a label so I can put out my own stuff. And I would like to put out tracks in this style. But if I do, I got to tell people, hey, this is what's coming. And I think with that honesty, that's the best. It's the best way to do it. Just being honest about it. But hey, we, we've talked about a lot of stuff, but we haven't talked about your album. We haven't talked about your new track. And uh, I'd love to hear about it. When is it coming out? How many tracks is it? What's the style? So as of now, it's just an off in the future album. Because, okay. like I was saying, I was watching all those documentaries and YouTube things. Like, there's like three in particular albums that I was really intrigued with how it was made and just like the attention to detail and all that kind of stuff in it, you know? And it was uh, Thriller, Michael Jackson, um, then uh, Pink Floyd, Another Brick in the Wall, slash Dark Side of the Moon, like kind of both of them. And then the one that I never would have expected before but i watched some documentaries about them and now i'm super into the fucking beach boys yeah. <laughs> beach boys pet sounds like, i mean that's a great album just as far as like hearing okay so a good example of like the stories thing so it's like i was looking for like our album to be as much like those as possible not sonically but just like the theme like for example pink floyd still like does the wall now you know what i mean that was like fucking forever ago so imagine instead of just trying to have a song and like a dj's play bot or play list for a few weeks or a month or two or something imagine being like i want a song that is going to last like 40 years <laughs> you know what i mean so it's like a big task but like thinking of it that way kind of changes everything about a year ago i kind of decided that i wanted to get into like doing stuff with vocals and i'd never really done it before like i'd just done uh i get like an acapella for like a remix from like a big label or something and then i'd use that but it already sounded awesome you know and i didn't have to write it and i didn't have to record it and process it or anything for me right now having full lyrics and everything and kind of putting everything you can into the song and trying to make it big over time it could be a lot bigger than what people are thinking you know <laughs> like that's awesome man that's the mentality another quote that i really liked it was i forget who said it but that a song doesn't die it just stops being managed okay so i, I have no idea how it happened but you know the running up that hill oh yeah like like i literally don't know the story so this is kind of a bad example but hypothetically not like how that song got like picked up by stranger things and or whatever, oh. you know what I mean? So like a hypothetical situation though, is what if there was like a person that was like a salesperson that had control of a catalog that was pretty much calling everybody on every show and movie and like knew all those people and was like, yo, I've got like this Pink Floyd album. Like <laughs> you already know what it is. Like you want to, or I got this Beach Boys album. Like <laughs> would that fit in any of your, you know what I mean? You could have somebody like pushing it forever. Like I said, I got, I don't know how it works with like some of the Beach Boys, but just think about like if you had that catalog, you could sell that just constantly for the rest right. of the end of time. Like, and you don't have to tell people like, okay, well, it's this group, and they were like ninety plus percent of the people are gonna be like, oh, of course I know what that is, and I'm aware of how it sounds, and I know multiple songs, you know. So like, if if you can get your art, I mean, I'm not trying expecting it to be as famous as Pink Floyd and Beach Boys, but like, if you can get your song, why not? I, I, I mean, your limiting beliefs. <laughs> you're, you're right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but it's like some of them are kind of reasonable to have. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. I'm not saying you no, should I mean, I'm, I'm place, so but... with you. I think you're so right. And I, I really like that. I mean, I've been doing that. Maybe not. Maybe I have been limiting myself, like you said, a bit. And, and I, I want to be as free as you are. That I'm j I'm inspired. I've done it in a smaller way. I've done like Not Again. I, I've recorded a lot of my lyrics myself. And I got people from Fiverr to like have the female response vocal. Yeah, it hasn't gotten where I want it to be. but Okay, so yeah, did you, how much did you do after it came out? I mean, I did, I did a good amount. Not as crazy 
as I should for sure. The most I have ever done was with Caracas. I had the music video done. If I may say so myself, I don't know anybody in electronic music that's not like the Chemical Brothers that has a video of that level. Again, it didn't it didn't blow up. Let's call it that. But it's a really I would How say How long ago was it? Oh, it was a while back, dude. Let me check well, it out. Well, say for now though, it's like, all right, let's say you you did that video now, okay? Yeah. You, you could now get two years ago. You could get a bunch of other people with iPhones filming everything that happens, like preparing for it, yeah. leading up to it and everything, and like be like, here's the makeup girl doing the makeup for the thing. Here's the fucking green screen getting delivered and getting set up by the whatever the fuck it is. <laughs> and like I'm just like you could make stories of this whole thing. And like for example, the uh the three albums I was talking about earlier. Yeah. So I was able to find all this information and get so inspired because they had so many stories to it. Like that's like what did it for me. Like uh like with Michael Jackson, like it's like okay like, I wanted to know how, like, Quincy Jones worked with them and stuff. So there's that story. And then there's, like, that Quincy pretty much knew everybody. So he could just, like, be like, oh, I know the best guitar player and keyboard players in, the, like, in the world or in the city. I know both of them. And, like, they 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 would get out and, like, leave their wife to go <laughs> come yeah. to the session right now. So, like, he was, like, able to do that kind of stuff, you know? And, like... He, he's incredible. Like, the, the behind-the-scenes stuff that I've seen with him is he's honestly... A, a genius and i think he's way more important in michael jackson's career than most people realize that's that example so quincy jones was like pretty much getting all the best people to come in and then helping michael with songs or whatever you know what i mean but that was like the thing i got out of that so like for that like on fiverr um i would actually like i was using chat gpt and being like give me the 20 like most random instruments that most people don't know about and then <laughs> any one that i didn't know i would like look on youtube and see like could i possibly use that you know what i mean and most of them know just fyi but like there's some random ones that like to be honest i don't think any of them actually came on the album so but yeah, I you kept just, your mind open, looking for Yeah, I was, like, sounds, trying to find, things. like, we weird things like that and, like, thinking of things I had never done before, too. It's, like, I'm that's kind of where I'm at now is I've been doing house for so long. And that limiting belief thing I was talking about just kind of made me be, like, fuck, like, I want to try some stuff that isn't this exact format, you know? And, like, a lot of this is house on the album, but there's a bunch that isn't as well. Okay, awesome. So you have, like, what do you have, to, like, transitional tracks or do you have just different genres? Different genres. That's so it's, cool. like... So a bunch of the house stuff was already like the music was like 70, 80 percent there. I sent that to the singer guy, you know, and he would like do that and play instruments and stuff and send it all back to me, like with a million layers and stuff. And uh, but then once we were playing on doing an album, we were trying to come up with all these other different genres that we could do that would make sense. The weirdest one is uh, uh, Nine Inch Nails Hurt. You know yeah. that song? Yeah. But okay. What, so what do you mean? <laughs> we did a, we did a song that's like like based off that kind of. Ah, okay. Uh, and yeah. have you seen the song Exploder about that on Netflix? Mm, no, I haven't. No. You should watch it. So basically, Trent Reznor sits there and talks about that song for like twenty minutes. He there's so much like thought put into all these things. Like he's like, I have like this weird tone to kind of like be like an ominous like film type of tone to make it sound like off putting, and then made sure like the strings were like slightly out of tune, and then like I hit like this weird note on this one chord to where it sounds like kind of sour, and then like I sing quiet and kind of out of key, like or like out of pitch a bunch of times and then i panned it over to the left a little bit and like made it kind of like inaccessible and then feel like this foundation is not stable you know gotcha. yeah having a having a theme having a special idea putting in the love and to the details that's, i i really like what you said about just thinking about this album at a higher level and not limiting yourself and thinking 40 years ahead i love that and, and I mean, I share that philosophy, but I I wanna I wanna take this inspiration from you from you to go further with it. Oh, yeah, it's like this is my first time trying this stuff, so it's like I don't have the formula yet. But like, uh, that's like the thought part. Like, I honestly kind of don't feel like doing music right now that doesn't have original vocals not for me but from somebody and it's very hard to get people to do it like way 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 harder than you'd ever imagine <laughs> that like that's partly why we're doing the album too is that we did a couple songs like you're a really good singer and you're way better than like a lot of these people that i can't even get to like respond to my email or something you know so let's 
lock in and do a whole bunch of stuff, you know? Then how is how is the album? Is it Wavepoint with him? Or are you guys... Wavepoint and the, and the Dropout. Wavepoint and the Dropout. And when does Now or Never come out? Where can people go check out all of your stuff? Like, we got to hit some plugs here. Yeah, uh, July 3rd just came out. Okay. July 3rd, it's already yeah. out. That's yeah. a miss on me. No, no, but no. Again, I, I confused it with the album. I was going to ask you when the album was it, coming out, but you already told me that it's a long... Yeah, but again, this is... I want to promote it now because now you can check it out. Like, I don't want to promote the next one. Like I've had I've had fights with... Not fights, but I've had discussions with labels where they're like, oh, we really need you to post these these things. I'm like, I, I don't post basically until the track comes out because I'm losing exactly what you said. Remember when you said about like, again, like having a gas tank that you fill up. If I ask you to go check out my track, but you can't buy it and you can't hear it. You're wasting their attention. I'm taking out a little bit of those favors and I'm not getting anything from it. There's no conversion. And what about your, your socials are all at Wavepoint Detroit. Wavepoint Detroit. Yeah. I mean, go check out Now or Never. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I've been really looking forward to hearing you know, like how you put the whole business sites together because that's super interesting for me and what I am building. Again, big fan of your music for the longest time. Thank you so much for hanging out, man. Hope the album goes insane and it lasts 50 years. We're out. You can check out everything. Link below. Ernesto's Beats. All right. See you soon. Subscribe.